Around the 9th century, windmills were first used to harness the power of the wind. They converted the wind's energy into rotational energy by means of inefficient blades and were mostly used for farming purposes, such as milling grain or pumping water. Similarly, wind turbines take advantage of the wind's motion to generate electricity. The demand for renewable energy has rapidly increased in the past decades due to the growth of the world's population and the subsequent increase of harmful emissions associated with the use of fossil fuels. However, wind turbines take up so much space that it is only viable to place them away from populated areas. This results in engineering challenges like transporting the electricity from where it is produced to where it is needed. As such, smaller turbines that are located within the populated regions that require the energy produced could be a more efficient solution. However, current technologies have yet to harness the winds for potential at this scale. An example is the Strata building in London, where it needs three 9 meter turbines produce a mere 10% of the building's energy needs. We were tasked to tackle this challenge by coming up with an innovative horizontal axis small-scale wind turbine that would be subject to the following constraints. It should rotate clockwise with a maximum angular velocity of 3000 rpm. Tested at 6, 8, 10 and 12 meters per second, the tip speed ratio or TSR must be between 3 and 8, a range at which the maximum power coefficient should be obtained. It must fit inside a box of 400 by 150 by 75 millimeters and be manufactured as a single part exclusively out of ABS plastic using a rapid prototyping technique. With all of this in mind, we set up to come up with our design. We started out by first deciding how many blades we want in our turbine. The main options were one, two or three bladed design. A one-bladed design experiences a comparatively higher centrifugal force due to a higher TSR and requires a delicately balanced counterweight. A three-bladed design, commonly seen in wind farms, provides much better performance in that situation. This is because it can harvest energy from wind that is not blowing normal to the blade. However, having more blades makes the turbine less aerodynamically efficient. This is due to interference effects, where the wake, which is the air downstream from the blade, affects the flow for the next blade. We came to the conclusion that a two-bladed design was a good middle ground due to the symmetry, reduced interference effect, and is easier to fit in the required box. Exploiting symmetry, we folded our turbine at the cone, using a ball and socket joint. This resulted in doubling the radius of our turbine, which maximized power extraction. In order to minimize drag, we used the hack series to design our cone. Turbine blades have aerofoil cross-sections that direct the lift force generator to rotate the turbine. The Air Force section SG6043 was chosen for its high lift to drag ratio at low speeds, matching the testing conditions of our turbine. The incidents had to be kept constant to achieve optimal lift, since the rotational velocity varies along the blade, twist is required to achieve this. From the lift coefficient against angle of attack plot of this airfoil, we saw that lift is maximised at 6 degrees incidence. For maximum power production, we need constant circulation along the span. This is achieved by varying the twist and the coordinate. There are two methods to achieve this, Betz and Schmidt. The Schmidt method was preferred as it models real life conditions closely by considering the effects of the air's rotation due to the motion of the turbine. It was used to find the optimum cord length and pitch angle at each point of the blade. A more reasonable result was also obtained at the root section. The optimum configuration was found using a MATLAB script which was verified by a Q-blade simulation. To analyse the turbine's structural integrity, we used simple beam theory. The blade was discretised into small sections using MATLAB. This allowed us to consider the different loads and the moments at every point. We were concerned about the stresses at the root, where the maximum centrifugal forces will act, and the deflections at the tip, since this is the part of the blade with the lowest strength. We made sure that the force experience did not exceed the tensile failure stress of the available material. The tip deflection found was small enough not to affect the aerodynamic performance of the turbine. To create an innovative design, we considered many bio-inspired features such as riblets inspired by the skin of sharks, a corrugated aerofoil inspired by dragonfly wings, and tubicles inspired by the flippers of humpback whales. The printer doesn't have the resolution to print the riblets at the size we desired, and during manufacturing they would be sanded away. 
As for the corrugated aerofoil, we felt that it was too adventurous as we would not have any means to predict how the turbine would behave. We don't know if it would even work. Thus, we concluded that the most feasible option were the tubicles. To ensure a tubicle design is more help than hindrance, we read multiple papers on this topic. We found that modelling it as a sinusoidal variation about the leading edge improved the wing's performance at small angles of attack. It also predicted to delay onset and severity of stall. With the analytical tools available, we were not able to determine the overall effect of including tubicles. To circumvent this, we assume linearity and superimpose the optimal design for the required wind turbine and the optimal sinusoidal variation of the tubicles. After testing different tubicle sizes, as suggested in literature, using Autodesk flow design, we decided upon a 4% variation as it was seen to generate the lowest drag. The manufacturing took place in three stages. We started by making the hub. It was a standard hexagonal prism that connects the wind turbine to the fence strip shaft. This was made using computer numerical control, CNC. Then we had to draw the holes, and the final result was wrong. So we headed back to the workshop and used manual drilling machines to put holes in the correct locations. The next stage was to 3D print the turbine, which required some careful considerations. Firstly, we decided to print our turbine upwards, from the leading edge to the trailing edge. This would ensure that we had a base from which the materials would be overlaid, instead of printing from a point to something bigger. Secondly, we printed a small section of our hinge to ensure that it works, which it did. After we printed the turbine, it was put into an ultrasonic bath to dissolve the support materials. Unfortunately, during this process, the vibrations caused the hinge to snap. The final stage was to sand the turbine to ensure a smooth surface and reduce skin friction drag. The wind turbine was tested in the Donald Campbell wind tunnel to determine its performance. During testing, minimal tip deflection was observed. Although this indicates good structural integrity, it might have been over-engineered and using thinner blades could have improved aerodynamic performance. The stall and subsequent recovery resulted in this periodic sound, which, to us, sounded quite terrifying. At approximately 3,700 RPM, the turbine was able to escape from this resonant behaviour. The maximum power output was 256 watts achieved at a wind speed of 12 meters per second. Our average maximum CP was 0.593, perfectly achieving the BETS limit. Unless we had built the perfect wind turbine, this is impossible. This phenomenon is likely due to erroneous data. We believe this is largely due to the blockage effect. The turbine, which is spinning at a high RPM, acts like a solid disc. This restricts the area in which the air can flow in the tunnel, thus causing the local wind speed of the turbine to be higher than that measured by the pitot-static tube. Our TSR at maximum CP was 7.5, significantly higher than our predicted value of 5.5. This is not unexpected as our prediction is based on a turbine without tubicles. This assumption was made in the design phase as we didn't have sufficient tools to accurately predict the turbine's behaviour. Given the opportunity to do this project again, we would like to further investigate the effect of tubicles and the cause of periodic acceleration during resonance. Although tubicles seem to have improved performance, the motion they experience is drastically different to that of a humpback whale. If the tubicles are indeed able to improve performance, the practical implications for wind turbines would be higher efficiency and a larger operational envelope. This could potentially make wind energy a more viable and reliable form of renewable energy, thus enabling our move towards a cleaner and greener society. Although our turbine did not perform as calculated, Overall, we are satisfied with the outcome as it yielded significant results and raised interesting questions regarding the use of tubicles. It was a project that brought us together to apply and combine our knowledge to design, build and test a wind turbine.